Kyla Scanlon, welcome to the deep end. Thank you for having me, Marshall. It's really good to see you. It's funny seeing your face if people are watching this on YouTube and not see the kind of edits. Your face is consistent across. That's really funny to see. For those of you who don't know Kyla, Kyla does an incredible amount of YouTube content and TikToks, and you usually are seeing them in that context, so it's funny to see it here. But speaking of which, let's just start discussing what I think really sums up you as a thinker, as a creator, as a person who has this sort of mission, which is around reshaping financial education, especially as relating to investment. How would you define the problem in the space? Because reshaping suggests that there's something going on right now that isn't working. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of different problems. Like one, the institutions tend to do a little bit of gatekeeping just around like finance in general, like, you know, understanding products, understanding how to like get access to products can be a little bit confusing. And Robinhood and all the other trading apps that like, came and democratized that. But now we have this big problem of like what Julian, um, who works on deck and I were talking about, like this problem of onboarding, right? And so like, how do you actually get people onto the apps? Like what's the very, very first step to becoming an investor? And there really isn't sort of that like path right now that's not like laid out really well anywhere. Um, so like, that's a really big issue. And then I think the other aspect of financial education is like, there's so many weird things that happen in the news and the news does something similar to the institutions where they tend to make things a little bit more complex than it needs to be. So how do you sort of reshape financial media along the way, make that more accessible, make that more tangible? Um, and that's oftentimes through like humor, um, which is what I try to do. Yeah. That's really interesting, especially around the onboarding point, because I'm curious, let's just play for our assumptions for a second. Why do we need to onboard a bunch of people into investing into the stock market? Because if we look at a lot of the rhetoric during the past year and a half of the pandemic, a lot of the rhetoric was around there's all these young people who were sitting at home and they just threw money into the stock market, just kind of gambling, not actually investing in a traditional way. So why exactly, aside from just the fairness aspect, obviously it doesn't seem fair that there are people who are very wealthy and they could put money into the stock market, or maybe that is the whole argument. Why should we be onboarding more people into the system? Well, so the point that you just made, like that all these people were like trying to get into GameStop, trying to get into AMC, it's because there's that lack of understanding. It's because that there, there's that like gatekeeping process. So you're going to like basically like throw stones at stuff that you don't understand. And that was through memifying the markets and being like, okay, if you're not going to like allow equal access, then we're just going to, you know, it's flip how the markets are supposed to act on its head. Like GameStop really really wasn't supposed to happen. Like fundamentally, like doesn't make sense. Um, and so I think like the, with the onboarding process, it's just about um, giving people the tools that they need. Like you don't have to, like if you, if somebody gives you a hammer, you don't need to use it, but you should still have like access to that hammer if you need to nail something into the wall. Like if people want to know how to invest, they should have the tools readily available to them to do so, or else we're going to have sort of like that mass chaos that we have with GME where people are memifying markets in order to understand them. So that's really helpful. So basically what you're suggesting is the problem isn't that folks were trying to invest amounts of money that they might not have known what to do with. The problem was they didn't actually have access or resources that would help them actually think through things. So the memes themselves were a convenient shorthand for all of those parts. Oh yeah. Memes are basically short form narratives and like, like GME, um, like people, I think a lot of the narrative too is sort of around get rich quick because we have like this lottery mindset society where it's like, okay, I'm going to like basically play this winning card and hopefully, hopefully I win, right? Like I'm going to play this card and hopefully I win. Um, and I think that's like how people think of the markets as like a casino. And so there isn't any narrative around long-term investing. Like you're going to help, like theoretically you shouldn't invest in GameStop and expect it to go up forever. Um, it was a total anomaly what it did. And so I think like, that's another thing is like, um, there's a discrepancy in how, like that long-term wealth creation and thinking critically about that. That's interesting that you're bringing up the long-term and short-term part because I was listening to one of your other podcast appearances and you talked a lot about the generational aspect mm -hmm. to so much that we're talking about. So I think you're Gen, you're Gen Z, mm -hmm. is that correct? I'm on the edge, yeah. yeah. On, on the edge. Mm -hmm. So how yeah. do you think of when you talk to people, when you actually interact with your audience, because I think that's the coolest thing of what you do, which is that you're not just yeah. sending off tweets or YouTube videos into the nether world. You're actually communicating with people directly. How do you think about your audience's perception 
an approach towards the market is? And what does that reflect about their actual generational experience? Yeah, I mean, so like with how I think about like my audience, first off, and like how that reflects their experience is like a lot of them at the very beginning of like when I first started creating content, were like, no, just tell us what stock to buy. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to tell you about monetary policy and you're going to listen because like what the Fed decides, what the Federal Reserve decides is going to impact so much more of your life. Like if you really, really zoom out here, it's, even if you don't invest in the stock market, it's really important to understand from like a macroeconomic perspective what's going on around you. And so that's what I do with my content. And that's what I try to get across to my audience is like, you have to understand like how the interworkings of everything happens. Because if you don't, you're going to be completely blindsided or you're not going to understand why interest rates are rising or, or like going higher or lower, you know? Um, and I think with the generational difference, um, I oftentimes have like younger people who are like, I don't even know where to begin. Like nobody taught me this. Um, and through just like listening to the content and like sort of that osmosis process, it tends to make a little bit more sense over time. Um, but a lot of the times they're more I, I, like, there's this really weird thing where I feel like this generation is pretty risky, but then they're also like really passive. So like there's some sort of underlying fear, I think, because we were so young during 2008, like there's definitely some like underlying trauma there. Uh, but it also shows up, I think, in this sort of like gambling mindset where it's like, okay, I'm so potentially like afraid that I'm just going to go all in. I just have to like jump feet first. And that's like when you have the GME like spiraling. Yeah. Something I'm curious about, given what you're saying is. And I plan on getting to the creator stuff a little later, but I just want to know when you're describing people in your audience, especially when you were starting out as saying, we want X thing, mm -hmm. how did you personally resist the urge to just give them that thing? Because if you're thinking about growing on a platform, the easiest thing in the short to medium mm -hmm. term would have been just pivoting to mm -hmm. a here's what stock you should buy. Because something you've actually talked about in other contexts too is the fact that when you're doing these pieces, you're not really giving your opinion in that same traditional way. Mm -hmm. So how do you just think about deciding what you're going to deliver to an audience and the actual incentives that you're going through on these different platforms? Yeah, I know. It, it's definitely tough. Like you can grow a lot faster if you're just like, hey, you buy this stock because <laughs> it's going to go up. Um, but for me, it was like, okay, I could do that, um, but I don't want to. And I don't want to like maintain a brand that does that. Like that's just not something that is appealing to me. And I don't think ultimately it's helpful for people. Like I think a lot of people right now are building stuff so other people can like piggyback off the back of other people's trades, which is like fine. I know a lot of people like don't want to make their own investments. They'd rather just like listen to other people. And that's totally fine. But I also think there's a lot of more room for just like discourse around financial education because this stuff is super interesting. Um, like it's just as interesting as, as sports, in my opinion. And it's just as weird as sports and it's just as wild and like wacky. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for that. Last big question to get into before we think about this right here is can you just explain a little more what you mean by gatekeeping mm. because i don't quite understand as a person who doesn't really invest what that means in today's mm. context yeah no no it's it that's a really good that's really a point um so basically uh, you know, I, I worked at an institution. I loved my times there in asset management, right? So like very traditional firm, wonderful firm. Um, but there tends to be discourse across like the main firms and across like, you know, financial advisors and that not everybody can get this stuff. So we have to kind of keep it locked away in our ivory tower of finance. So we're the only ones who have access to this information. We're the only ones that can profit off this information. And, you know, it, that's just how it is, right? Like it's industry secrets. But the, the, the concept is like oh, anybody can really understand the business, right? Like everybody goes, you know, people go to Starbucks, they understand like they get their coffee and then they go, but that, that's a transaction. And the coffee was made like with a supply chain, like it has inputs, it has outputs. Um, so anybody can understand a business. And if you can understand a business, you can invest. And so I think firms, there's been a tendency within the financial space to want to keep everything at this really, really high level. So that way you don't have a ton of people, you know, investing, you don't have a ton of people maybe having access to that. And I don't think a lot of it probably isn't intentional, um, but I do think there is some, some intent behind it that you have to have like a financial advisor to walk you through every little step of your life. It might be nice to have one, sure, but do you need one, especially like Gen Z? Um, maybe not, yeah. Can you, something I appreciate you doing your posts is you'll usually have like a bear in a bull case. So that was basically your bull case for 
your bull case against gatekeeping, but what about the other direction of it? Because another part of the narrative going back to January was that actually there wasn't enough of, there wasn't enough oh, gatekeeping. And actually sure. like the platforms themselves were actually designed in ways that were almost not exploitative, probably isn't the right word, but just yeah. took too much advantage. So once again, there's a balancing act to be done here maybe. So what would you say would probably be the bear case against the internet decentralizes everything and prevents mm -hmm. gatekeeping? No, yeah, I mean, that's a, this is a super good point. I, I, I like, so the reason I ended the statement, like some people do need a financial advisor, some people don't, is because it's true. Like the problem, the problem in the best part about finance is like, it's so personal. So like, I think that's sort of the bare case is how do you personalize your product? How do you personalize something that's decentralized for every single person? Um, because people also really like, like that personalized advice. Like they like going to a financial advisor. They like talking to them. So I think there's a lot more room for sort of like well, that onboarding process, right? Like just getting people through the freaking door, just getting them open with a portfolio, but then maybe offering them off to like a more centralized party. That sounded really not great. The way they're not offering them off, but like helping them get access to tools that they would need, which might include um, not to like target financial advisors here, but just might include working with institutions, you know? Yeah. Because so they're needed. Yeah. No, please. Yeah. That's um, a useful pivot into your actual ideas because in the Substack and your longer term blogging, you're usually discussing a stock or an idea or a context. I would love just to kind of go through what you've been writing, what you've been thinking about. So we're recording this mm -hmm. on Monday the 2nd. So your newsletter mm -hmm. today spoke around two things, one of which I want to dive, in, dive into because you kind of previewed it a bit, which is that you're writing about how um, ed tech stocks were performing in China. That's going to come out um, at some point soon. But what does that concept or news event really refer to and how should people think about the broader narrative there? Yeah, yeah. So I'm working on a piece around what happened in, in China. So China has been um, cracking down on some of their you know, public facing companies. So you had the cancellation of the financial IPO, you had Jack Ma um, you know, go under the radar for a little bit. They went after Diddy. Um, most recently, there was a crackdown on the ed tech sector. And so I, the whole piece is really more so around like how this is how this is sort of reverberating through um, the United States of America, through how we structure financial products. So we have indexes, which is going to be basically things that like track all these companies. They aggregate um, companies in China, America, whatever. You'll have it like a China index and it tracks a bunch of companies in China. And then you'll have um, ETF issuers. So fund managers like iShares, um, Vanguard, who put together these ETFs that are you know, invested in by all sorts of different people. And then you have asset managers who are like some of the world's biggest institutions who have to follow um, to a certain extent what the indexes are doing. So like they can't deviate that that much and not to like I, I won't complicate it but like because of tracking error and so like there's this big issue of like financial products in the united states kind of having like this contagion effect and then in china um noah smith wrote a really good piece around how china is just like very focused on you know positioning into hard tech and for china the shareholders in the united states the shareholders come first so companies are meant to maximize shareholder wealth that's like a core component of what they're meant to do if they're public companies but in china they're they're working for the government and so the government is going to um, you know go into any company that they think is not working for the you know the best interests of the chinese government and it's china as a whole and basically you know tear it down they're willing to sort of like cut off their arm to save their leg i guess you could say um, and that's what happened with EdTech and they're facing um, turning all of the EdTech companies into nonprofits. And Ray Dalio had a really good piece about it. And he was like, well, they just really want to make sure that there's equal access to education. And if you have like educational companies that are monetizing, uh, equal access isn't a thing just because some people can afford to pay that price. And so there's just a lot of um, stuff happening in China that is a little bit different than like how the United States operates. But American investors look at China and they say, oh, like they see tech the same way that we see tech. So in the United States, Facebook is a technology company. In China, Facebook would not be a technology company. Only semiconductors, hard tech would be considered technology in China. And because China wants to pivot to this hard tech outward facing thing, they're going to destroy the quote unquote Facebooks or not destroy, but um, sort of de-elevate the Facebooks of China in order to elevate the hard tech platforms. And because there's this financial product contagion effect in the United States, the United States is really exposed to that sort of decision-making process 
that is owned by the Chinese government. And all of this is just objective, right? Like I'm not pointing fingers at um, the government or saying that they shouldn't do that. Um, but yeah, that's just uh, the, the issue. Mm-hmm. This is fascinating. And you are pushing the limits of my limits as a podcaster to pivot this into the next topic. So I'm just going to okay. be very direct. What is so great, audience, about Kyla is you're writing around these really diverse, really unintentionally related issues. So I have no ability to pivot this very smoothly (laughs) into video games, which was the topic of the actual uh, post that you put out today. So let's just talk about that. So like, let's talk about video games. What's so interesting for me is I'm, I'm almost 30 years old and all of a sudden just tech Twitter, all these different places. I'm now hearing more about video games than I've heard about Mm since I was back in high school, actually Mm -hmm. buying a significant number of games. Mm -hmm. So what's, what is the video game space right now? So there's, it's not just, you know, a game console thing. There's always different things going on. What is the video game space right now? And then we'll just kind of dive deeper and go through it. Yeah. The video games, it's so cool right now. There's so much of awesome stuff happening, especially because it's being like integrated with crypto increasingly. Um, Epic just announced that they're doing like a ton of work with, which has also become buzzword is like the metaverse. Um, Facebook is like super integrated with that too, or like working towards that. Um, one of the companies that I just am obsessed with is Roblox and they're a video game platform and they're a human co-experience platform. But basically like, Wait, quick, like I want to, I want to, I want to stop you just because you okay. have this thing, Kyla, where you say a million interesting things okay. and <laughs> three sentences. And I usually don't interrupt, but I'm just going to. Go for Start it, yeah. interrupting. Okay, so one, yeah. what is the metaverse? Hmm. Yeah, so basically it's like the, the physical manifestation, quote unquote, of the internet. So basically it's like the VR, AR in integration of the internet. So sort of like how you would think of the next phase of, of interacting with each other online. So rather than us like, you know, talking on the Zoom right now, we would be sort of like in the same room with each other. It'd be more so like we were in a studio with one another. Um, and then like even beyond that, a lot of people talk about like, oh, you can wear certain clothes when you're in the metaverse, like you can do holographic clothes or whatever. But I think like even beyond that, like there's so much room for how we think about education. Like you can actually immerse children in like an educational experience, right? And you can learn so much more through implementing the tools that the metaverse is going to have. Um, so it's just sort of like that. It's like, it's a super... Uh, I, in maybe this isn't fair to say, but I would say it's a super um, spread out topic. Like it's not super tangible quite yet, but a, a lot of people are like, making moves on it. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the example of like concerts in Fortnite. Mm, so there's all exactly. these like different. So, yeah. cause I remember in another appearance, you talked about how you're really interested in these metaverse adjacent companies. So other than, other than, other than zoom, other than a better version of this podcast, which is actually really exciting because as you know, it's sort of difficult to do this over zoom, Mm -hmm. but also Mm -hmm. we're by coastal right now. You're in LA, I'm in New York city. It's amazing. We could do this, but there's a next level to this that would actually Mm -hmm. make it Mm -hmm. much more interesting. Can Mm -hmm. you talk about the broader companies with video games, obviously being like the first input? Um, What do you see as other categories that folks are interested in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a ton, like, so everybody's like very into the creator economy, right? And like, I think video games are the perfect way to like start building towards that because you have a ton of developers who like indie, indie developers that are just building games. Um, and like you have in-game monetization, right? So digital payments, right? That could be executed in these video games because they already have like an in, in the game economy. Um, so I think like, that's really cool to like, think about how that is executed. I think from the creator perspective, that's really cool to see how that's ex- ex- executed. Um, there's just a ton, a ton of different things that you could build out yeah so next question is can you talk about roblox and like so this is the video game company you referenced i actually know of it just in the sense that it's in the zeitgeist but i don't actually play or use anything Mm -hmm. with it so can you just describe for me and our listeners we're learning together about the game the company and how it actually works as a model yeah no i mean i i wrote this paper on it that um, like back when I, when I first started, uh, kind of writing financial stuff again, I wrote about Roblox. And so like the way that I see them is like a call option on, on the metaverse, like the call option on the open source creator economy. So basically if you're bullish on those things, like Roblox is a great way to get exposure to that. Um, and it, the way that Roblox operates is through like, you know, you have your online identity, you have friendship, like it's, right now it's the kids game. So you'll have like your online identity, you'll, you'll have your little block guy, and then you'll have your friends who are on there. You can like go talk to them. Um, and then it's immersive, right? So you're kind of immersed in this like online world where you're interacting with your friends or you're playing different games and then it can operate from anywhere. So like Roblox's main MO right now is like, how do we expand abroad? And it's also how do we age up our user base? Because 
um, it's not about just like sort of the, like Roblox is a kid's game right now, but it's like, how do we age up our user base? How do we get more developers on the platform? And that'll enable them to like keep on building to this next iteration of the internet, which would be ultimately the metaverse. Um, and so like the way that they operate, which is like really cool is they have this, this flywheel. They have a consumer social flywheel. So they're, they're an OG consumer social company. They've been around since 2004. So they have their developers, they have that experience that I talked about. Then they have engagement. So you like, you have the friends are wa walking around, you're able to like talk to your friends on the platform and that creates it's a social aspect of it. Um, and then you also have like the players who are interacting with each other as well. And then they have their Roblox, um, which is their, their monetization. So their money. Um, and that's what people get paid in. And that's what people purchase on Roblox. And that's how they monetize the actual game. Um, so it's, it's a ton of different things. And it's, um, it's really cool. Yeah. And something that people are probably going to be curious about is what specifically has happened in the past few years has made this space. So like the, once again, the idea of the metaverse, it's not a new idea. It's mm -hmm. um, video games are obviously not new things. Like, what has been the market or social development that's really fueled this? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of things, right? Like, so the pandemic was just definitely like a catalyst to a lot of this. Like, we were just so alone and so stuck inside. So I think that really helps. But then also, I think like you know, sort of like anyone who's probably like under 30, under 35, we interact primarily online. Like we don't really see it. Like there's a ton of charts out there that are like, you, like people our age hang out alone a lot more often. And so I think like being online is just where a lot of us are increasingly comfortable. Is that good or bad? I don't know. But these games and these companies that are building towards creating a more interactive and more social uh, experience online are, are able to leverage from, from that changing way that we interact. Yeah. So the next other pivot is let's talk about grocery stores. We are getting worse and worse with the pivots, the topics. <laughs> so you did, you did two pieces, yeah. but I found these very interesting because I really like pieces where you take an everyday experience that you just have mm -hmm. as a consumer and you mm -hmm. actually help us understand them through these broader idea concepts. So let's start mm -hmm. with dollar stores. I haven't been in a dollar store for like 10 years, but you really wrote this piece about how the market when it comes to grocery stores is really just bifurcating. You're having these dollar stores, everyone has their whole foods, that different direction. So let's just start talking about a, like, why are you interested in writing out dollar stores mm -hmm. and what do they say about frankly, the broader market and economy today? Yeah. I mean, so like, why did I write about them? I wrote, so I used to write a lot when I was in college and I did like a little equity research piece on them and had done some initial research. And then a chart surface that showed their margins like relative to Target and Walmart and like dollar stores are so much more profitable than like a, a Walmart or a Target. And I was like, oh, like maybe I should do a deep dive into this again. And I'm from Kentucky and um, dollar stores are just kind of like part of the deal there. Like there's just a lot of them um, because it's part of their target audience, right? So like a rural area, um, not not necessarily like all of Kentucky, but like lower income sometimes. And top dollar stores, like if they find an open field with that perfect demographic, they're just going to plop a store down there. Um, and so that was the big thing. And then I was just really interested in, uh, you know, sort of this evolution of food, like how do we consume goods and what does it mean to actually like have a quote unquote cheap product? Because the way that dollar store does it is they sell you um, smaller items for less, right? So it's actually more per unit. It's, it's more expensive than like going to a Costco. You're paying more technically per item. Uh, it's just less at the time. So Wait, it's not so at, what's, what's actually, this is a useful point to hit to make sure everyone, because not everyone has been to a dollar store despite how spread they are. So mm -hmm. is it that every single item in the store is one dollar or is mm -hmm. it that like, how does this physically work? Because I get, because mm -hmm. I, I saw in your piece about how it's actually more expensive, but can you just actually like outline someone walks in, mm -hmm. is it that they see toilet paper and each roll is only a dollar? Like how does, how does that work? Yeah. So like, there's really two main players, like in the dollar store space. So there's dollar general and then there's dollar tree. So dollar tree is going to be more of like that $1 place. Dollar general likes to be known as a discount retailer. Um, so like, that's the really big difference. Like not everything there is going to be a dollar, but like you would pay, like theoretically you would pay like, um, you know, $9 for some toilet paper, like a small thing of toilet paper. Um, and it's going to be like, like a dollar, right. Or $9 for that. But if you paid, um, but at uh, like at Costco, you'd pay like eighteen dollars for um, like three of those, so it'd be cheaper, 
right? Like, so if, it, over time, like it's, it's more per unit at the dollar store, um, but they charge you less like upfront. So it's like, um, it seems as though it's cheaper, but it's actually not because it's more per unit, if that makes sense. Yeah. So then is that perception or at least the real way that the dollar stores are flooded the market? Like what's making these companies then so successful then? Cheapness and ubiquity. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you can know, okay, you can know that it's cheap. You can know that you're not getting a great deal. You can know that you're going to be paying more over time, but sometimes all you have is like $9. You don't really have $18 to go to Costco. You don't have the money to get a Costco membership. So you're stuck paying that upfront price that seems cheaper now is actually more down the line. So it's just, um, they really play into the demographic. Yeah. You know, I'm really happy with you, Kyla, because you set me up to pivot to Costco. Oh, we good. did it successfully, but because I commented awesome. on it, it doesn't even count yeah. anymore. Costco, yeah. let's talk about Costco. Costco, not only have you written about it, obviously, but it seems to be at the exact opposite end mm. of the market expectations, what's getting delivered here. So A, like what is Costco? And B, what mm. are the fundamentals yeah. that really make it a strong company? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Whenever somebody asks me like what Costco is, I like to say like an adult Disneyland because I think that's <laughs> what it is. Like basically adults love going there and like getting these really big, it's like an experience, right? And that's how the Costco CEO Jim designed it is you go there and it's like you you have, so you have your core products, but then you also have like these treasure products. So like that'd be a jacuzzi or whatever, but you also have your core products, which would be like toilet paper. And so you go there like with your grocery list, but you also go knowing that you're going to spend a little bit more. And that's, you know, where they make a little bit of money is like this, this treasure hunting aspect of it. But they are just so efficient with their supply chain. So they do cross stocking. Um, they don't have like as many stops as a Walmart would because they just have everything laid out in the store. They have of just crates. Um, it's super simple. It's just a warehouse uh, versus Walmart where they take everything out of Kroger. They take everything out and put it up on the shelves. At Costco, you just kind of get what you see. Um, but they treat their employees really well and they treat their customers really, really well. And because of that, they do well. It's, it's sort of that, like, that, that core component of being a successful company is you just have to treat people well. And that's what Costco has done really well over time. And, and they make sure they operate with, with a low price in mind. So they're going to do everything that they can to keep prices low for consumers. They don't want to raise the price. Like there's this story that um, you might have heard of, like the CEO not wanting to raise the price of a hot dog and somebody like this, this it's a famous 50, thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They like, um, I think it, I think it's somebody asked him like, can I raise the price of the hot dog? And he was like, if you did that, I'll kill you. Um, they're, they're very, 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 very focused on keeping prices low for consumers because that is who they exist for consumers. Yeah. You know, I love the adult Disneyland comment because I liked going there as a kid for the snacks, but that was it. But yeah. now that I'm an adult, it's it's kind of like Ikea. There are these experiences you have that are like in the right context, like genuinely really fun. So that's exactly in that category. So next, I want to really just take this to its most like top line level, especially for listeners who are basically just following the news. They're going to think of this most. Let's just hear a bit about your writing around the stonk market. So you notice I'm not saying stock mm -hmm. listeners. What is a stonk? Mm -hmm. What is this like broad narrative and what does it actually mean yeah. for everything we're thinking about when it comes to investor education? Yeah. Um, it's so, I don't know if this is intentional or if I like position myself, but I've had a couple of people reach out and be like, I know you because you write about meme stocks. I'm like, I didn't know that I did that that often. Um, but you know yeah, I, mean, I know, I know what the answer is. Here's what happens. If you go to your sub stack, if you actually look at your most read piece, it's the one with the stonk. So yeah. that's what appears when someone sees it. So I think that oh, freezes in everyone's okay. head because I think about Got it the it. same way. But because you don't write out that every single time, but I'm just pretty yeah. sure whenever anyone interacts with you online, that's the first thing they see. Yeah. It's my pen tweet too. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, so this was like my very first research piece, like back in the game. And I just was like noticing all this super weird stuff happening. Like that was during the height of the NFT bubble. That was during the height of Kathy Wood and sort of like the ARC, um, you know, buying up every small biotech company in existence. Uh, and then there was also during like the GME AMC stuff. And so I was just like, wow, like markets are being totally memefied. And 
a lot of that, like consent, what I was talking about at the beginning of the, the podcast, where it's like memification implies that we need some sort of like understanding about it because memes are ultimately short from narratives. Um, and so like, that's the main thing is like people are memeing the markets in order to understand them. Um, and there's also just a lot of like discovery, I think, happening. So like you see that, especially in NFTs and NFT bubbles, like everybody was saying, oh, I don't know what this is. I'm going to buy one just in case. And, and that's a part of the process. But that acceleration and that FOMO that exists within, I think, the aspect of memification only um, seeks to make it even more memeified. I'm curious, and especially as a meme analyst, we're just going to put that title on you. <laughs> what is it possible for an institution to purposely design itself to be memed? Because mm. it seems if you're trying to create a company or you're trying to create some type of marketing thing, memeability would seem to be a strength. How do you, how do you, or so my, here's the question Are memes purely organic? Is a meme something you can't just make happen? It's just going to happen, right? So no one at GameStop or AMC was thinking about this. How, how do you think about like yeah. memification? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's interesting, right? Like, I think a lot of the corporate brands have ended up memifying themselves, especially on Twitter. Like, Stakeum, if you follow yeah. their account, yeah. They do this. So, so like, Stakeums, they're, they're, I'm trying to remember all the... So Wendy's is really kind of sassy. Stakeums is coronavirus information, right? And also, like, post-rational ideologies. Like, they did this big thing about, like, um, this big death thread about, like, disinformation and stuff like that. So... Um, it's a super intense stuff coming from a steak brand. And uh, I think that is memification and brands can do it, but they have to do it really intentionally. Um, Cause you can't just like, it'd be weird if all the brands like started doing that. And so brands are like entities and I think that they can be memified with GameStop. It was just because of the short sellers, but oh, the short sellers made it so memeable. Like they're just so goofy in the way that they like talk about stuff. And so it's like, of course you're going to gather attention. And so I think there's just a lot of like different pointers happening at that time. Yeah. No, oh, that's helpful. So here's the big question. The big question is, like I said earlier, if this is January, we're talking just about GameStop, the memes, AMC, it's August, 2021, especially for listeners who are entering into this space, who are just curious, what should they just be thinking about? in terms of the narrative? Yeah, I mean, like right now, it's it's kind of interesting because you have the Federal Reserve who it, everybody's like, are you going to taper? And if they taper, that'll put a little bit of a rein on the market. So basically like- Sorry, what's back tapering? On, yeah, so but it, tapering would basically mean that they're pulling back on some of the easy money policies that they've enacted. So instead of having interest rates that are near zero, it'd be not that much higher, but it's more so like a signal to the market. Like, Hey, we think things are going a little bit too fast. Like this fire is burning a little too fast. We're going to pour some water on it. You got to chill out. And so basically it'd just be the fed, like telling everybody to chill out. And so when the fed tells everybody to chill out, it tends to spook people. Um, so the market can be a little shaky during those times, but I think like the most important thing, and this is one thing that gets highlighted a lot by like financial writers is time in the market is more important than like right decisions in the market. So if you just like kind of get into the market, you make that initial investment, it's going to pay off over time um, because the market is always going to cycle out, but 53% of the time it goes up. Right. And so the main thing is just like getting in, um, even if it's just buying like the spy ETF, which is S and P 500, which is 500 top companies, um, just getting exposure to, to that upside benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. And I think it's a, actually useful time for us to pivot this conversation more pivot. towards you as a creator and how you just think about all this stuff. Because the reason why I went in this specific order is I wanted to really demonstrate your range and the spaces you're covering and like the actual like deep relationship you have with your stuff. Like you weren't someone who woke up one day and said, I'm going to start doing threads about random stuff in order to get engagement. You actually are really deep on the subject. So can you just talk a little bit about your journey, did you just wake up one day and say, hey, TikTok looks fun. I'm gonna start doing TikToks about, TikToks, is that even the right way to describe it? Yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. gonna start, I'm gonna start creating content around the in investment space. How did, how did that actually work for you? 
Yeah. I, I don't think a ton of people know this, but I've been on it for a while. So I started my blog when I was 18. Um, I, I was options trading and was like, oh, I don't understand. And so uh, I was in Kentucky and I was like, the only way that I'm going to, you know, talk to people who also understand this stuff is if I'm online and writing about it. And so I started writing about it online. I got to, I went on Twitter and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And was following some big accounts and all the while was like writing my little blog. Um, and then I went to go work in the industry and the blog shifted for two years more to like statistical analysis type stuff, data science. Uh, and then like once I left that job in February, uh, it was just back to back to stock stuff. But um, did you graduate TikTok, from college early? No. No, Are I you young for your years. age? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was just trying to, I was trying to do the math in my head. You're like, I'm, you know, 23 did two years. Okay. That makes more sense. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, well, it wasn't quite two years. I just, I just round up. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, sounds better. Um, but yeah, so, um, but the TikTok happened in December, 2020. So I was still, um, at my old place and I was doing like science videos and stuff. And then I just, um, started doing, You're doing like, science videos. Yeah. This is, yeah these like, are fun tidbits. What, 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 what science videos were you doing? Oh, I would do like on different types of fruit, like popularity theory. Um, I did some stuff on like actually the TikTok algori okay, algorithm. Wait, I, have and, like, stop, I have to stop you. What is popularity theory? So basically it's like everybody thinks that nobody likes them sort of thing, but people who think that people like them tend to be more popular. So it's just sort of that reinforcing bias. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And you were doing that with fruit, you said? No, no. Fruit was a different video. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Just, that was just two separate <laughs> I guess this yeah. is TikTok is a visual medium and as you're trying to describe yeah. it purely orally, that doesn't work. That doesn't work as well. Yeah. Okay. So it's December, yeah. you pivot into more uh, investment focused stuff and like what, what kind of basically happens there? Yeah. I mean, it was pretty cool. Like I had, I, I mine, mine was slow growth. Um, I'm still like a relatively small TikTok account. So basically um, I would just post every day, a daily market update and be like, Hey, this is what happened in the stock market today. Uh, and I just tell people what happened in the stock market that day. And people were like, Oh my gosh, so awesome. Uh, and then I started doing, so I have two types of content I have the market updates and then I have the skits and the skits began with Archegos, which was another big thing that happened a fund implosion. So this big fund just blew up. Uh, in the market totally like was like, whoa. And so I did a TikTok skit around that um, and just pretend to be Goldman and the head of Archegos. And that did really well on Twitter. It was the first one that I cross posted over to Twitter. Um, and yeah, and then I just started doing more skits and I basically just tested my, or am testing really my creative limits and sort of editing. I, I don't have a background in video editing. So I'm trying to figure out like what resonates with people. I like to do kind of, I guess, weird content. People have said it's a little weird. So um, yeah, uh, it's just, how do you have fun, right? Because like a lot of the times we forget that the markets are supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be this boring drag of a thing. Wait, are markets supposed to be fun? They that's are. A, that's, that was a big, yeah. that was a big assertion. You just <laughs> casually were like markets. I'm like, I mean, do they have to be fun? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like why shouldn't they be? Why should they be boring? It's so cool if you think about it. Like we have all these companies that you can just like get a piece of um, and they they all have different stories. And if you can unpack that and like just figure out like all these different dynamics, it's like, like it's like biology, right? Like the market is like a living, breathing being. Like why wouldn't, why wouldn't that be cool, right? You just caught me gatekeeping. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? This is supposed to be no, boring no, and we have our advisors and you know. <laughs> I'm. I do think I'm in the minority of like those who think it's like super, super interesting, but I just think it's like, so, so fascinating because it plays into money. Like just the mere concept of money is so important. Like we all need it for better, or for worse. And money is in the markets, right? And money is, is, is a core component of how we think about the financial system. And so it's super, not only is it interesting to think about how money flows like through an economy, but it's also interesting to think about how companies utilize, utilize it to grow and like who succeeds, who doesn't, why do they succeed? What can you learn? Um, yeah, it's, it's like just constant. It's just different every single day. It's super cool. Yeah. It's interesting. We'll get back to TikTok in a second, but I'm realizing there's an alternate universe where you're just super obsessed with crypto and that's your thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. how do you think about crypto, especially given like, what are you choosing to platform in terms of the stuff you're really focusing on and talking about? 
Yeah, a TikTok makes it hard to focus on crypto um, because they tend to shadow ban that content. Which Wait, shadow oh, banning? That's, that's fascinating. I had no yeah. idea. So uh, it's more of a recent development, but there's a lot of people on TikTok who shell different coins, and TikTok, uh, I think it's two weeks ago, was like, "Stop that!" And so they put this, you know, ban in place, and basically the algorithm will pick up different words that you say, and if you say crypto, it's likely that you're going to get less views on the video. It's going to get less reach, and you know, just the 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 habit of being a content creator, you do want more views, so you just tend to shy away from that content, or at least I do. Um, but no, I love crypto. I think it's super fascinating. I would say I'm like maybe a kindergartner. I'm still like trying to understand everything. Uh, but yeah, I think it has, it'll have huge implications on on the system. I think what's so interesting about what you're describing is I want to go back to your reference to creative limits, because I think that's a really interesting way of framing what you're actually doing here. Because what I really appreciate about everything you're doing, you made reference to people saying your content is weird. I would say your content is quirky. That'd be the way I play, way I placed it. But there's a reason why everyone on Twitter is joking about everyone having the same version of the same Twitter thread of the same 10 lessons from this CEO thread here, blah, 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 blah. How do you describe the process of pushing your creative limits? Because I think that's something that separate from just your content, I would say the actual mentality you're bringing here is really underserved in like the content market here. So tell me more about that. Yeah. I mean, for me, like I never thought I'd be like doing skits and, and that sort of thing, but it's actually really quite fun to, to like tie together all these different ideas. Um, so like, how do you get Jeff Bezos going to the moon in the same video as Kathy Wood talking about Bitcoin and the same video as Elon Musk talking about Doge? Like, how do you tell that narrative within 60 seconds? And like creating a skit around that is actually really interesting. And you're able to utilize like all your facial, ex I don't think it's acting. It's more like somebody told me it's like stand up comedy, I guess. I don't know. Um, That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and you can use emojis within the text and you can use like different body language stuff. Um, you can use the other characters as like a uh, response board. So like one would make a face at the other. It's just like, there's so much that you can do to tell that story that doesn't need to necessarily be like, you know, a long news article, but rather you can do it in a short form video and tie together a lot of different concepts at the same time, while also like poking fun at how bizarre the markets can be sometimes. Yeah. I think something we're really getting to is I'm I'm reviewing my own insecurities as a creator because the other thing you're doing that really, really impresses me is you're taking this niche in this area you focus on across all these different areas. So you're podcasting and you're on YouTube and you're doing TikTok and you have a big Twitter following and on and on and on and on and on. And I think a lot of people, including myself, like to say, well, you know what? I'm audio first. Um, so it's actually okay that I don't tweet because it just that's just my best area. That's oh, my best okay. side. And I would rather be a pointy spear. You're obviously not taking that approach. So I would just love to hear more about how you think about mm -hmm. these different platforms. Because the thing that's interesting here is that the type of stuff that does well on YouTube is not the type of stuff that does well on a podcast necessarily. And it's not the type of stuff that does well on Twitter. So how do you try to do all these different things not literally at once, because that makes it seem haphazard, but how do you strategically approach these different mediums when most people tend to focus on, I've noticed one to two things? Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I just kind of like doing it all. And I love creating content and, and sort of like testing, they're like testing my limits again, you know, it's just about like, what can I do? And I think I like wanted to just discover that. So with YouTube, I basically just turned my sub stacks into YouTubes and that's a little bit easier, but within the YouTube, there's so much more room for like making fun of stuff or like, um, you know, making jokes and you can be a little bit more yourself. Uh, and then also with the TikToks, like that's just like where I, where I can run with different ideas and like the feedback loop on TikTok is phenomenal. So like the audience will let me know if they don't like an idea and that can inform my sub stack that can inform, the, inform my YouTube that can inform the podcast. So I learn a lot from TikTok and on YouTube, I can figure out, um, you know, what might sit well on TikTok, like what could use sort of a clip. I tend to clip my YouTubes for TikTok. And that from that, like I'm able to figure out what resonates with the audience also. So it's just basically like, uh, how do I get exposure to as many feedback loops as possible? Because that's going to help me dial in on what people actually like and need. 
a little bit faster than just focusing on one thing. You know, I'm so glad you described feedback loops and audiences because you're getting to an argument I have with the co-host of my other podcast, Sagar and Jetty, around audience feedback and whether or not one should literally or even metaphorically read the comments. So on TikTok, yeah. I guess feedback wouldn't necessarily just mean reading replies. It could also mean like it's performing well. So when you talk mm -hmm. about audience feedback and integrating in that, how, what do you mean by that specifically? Yeah. I, I always read, I make content for people <laughs> like, um, they're taking their time to listen to me and to give me feedback. Sometimes, sometimes the comments are weird. I tend to ignore them. Um, but if they're like, <laughs> the, the, yes, that's the, the understatement of this episode is sometimes the comments are weird. Sometimes they're scary. Yeah. But most I'm gonna, of the time, I'm going I'm to, the way to understand this audience is I'm a normal looking adult male. My comments are very weird. So everyone should just scale up and imagine how weird they get across all uh, these different platforms. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Well, it's good on TikTok because like the audience has sort of gotten around the idea that, um, I don't tolerate like people just being weird. Um, but anyway, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like if people are like taking the time to comment and, and sort of think I've gotten some of my best video ideas from comments, um, and, and giving them full credit, like during the video, but it, it, like, you know, it's for them. They're my audience. I want to make sure that they like what I'm doing. Um, so that that's why I read, read the comments and it can be a lot sometimes, especially if like, you know, there's a lot of comments and not all of them are helpful. But usually I can get a pretty good idea of like sifting through like, okay, that's good. That's bad. Like they're giving me feedback on, you know, how I'm saying something, how I'm describing something. Um, they're saying something that's useful. That's an add on to my video. Like I did a video about Bernard Ono, who's the um, CEO of LVMH and he just became richest man in the world again. And somebody was like, Casual oh, like he again. actually, the way you just said that <laughs> again, you know, <laughs> I mean, Jeff Bezos, like go neck and neck. It's the most, like, I mean, rich people problems are like, oh, I'm second once again, <laughs> oh, can't deal. Um, but yeah. And somebody was like, oh no, actually like he inherited that wealth and you should look into that. And I did. And it, like the whole story just unravels even more but just based on that one comment. So yeah, it's helpful. Yeah. I'm just gonna ask another follow-up on this because I'm actually, I'm really surprised at your answer and I'm, I'm wondering, um, a lot of people in the creator space have just very, very serious thoughts on, I just don't read the comments. So for example, um, Joe Rogan types would just say, explicitly, just never read the comments, just don't do it. And I'm wondering two things. I'm wondering one, um, you know, you know, you have a, you have a background as an athlete. So I'm curious if maybe maybe you're just used to performing very publicly for people in a way that could be very critical. So maybe that gives you a degree. And I'm, I don't mean to shame anyone who doesn't feel the ability sure. to read the comments, but I'm wondering if that give, gives you a degree of mental fortitude. And then two, I'm wondering if maybe this is just the category you're in. So for example, mm -hmm. there's a world where you're doing like beauty makeup tips and people, they are just brutal and terrible. But I feel like you've been doing this for so long. And by long, I mean, in the sense that content creation works, that the type of person who's attracted to actually a pretty highbrow TikTok financial content mm -hmm. is probably pretty good faith in the interaction. So I'm just curious about your responses to those two points. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, like, honestly, TikTok has made me a lot tougher. Like some of the comments are mean and I'm like, whoa. Um, and you just have to like get over it, you know, like, okay, that one person thinks that about me, whatever. And so if you keep on feedback loops, once again, like if you keep on iterating on that, like, okay, that person thinks I'm stupid, um, whatever, like, the other, these other 99 people don't. And so you just have to focus on the positivity and reading the comments helps a lot with that. I think with running, like I, I was a D1 um, runner at Western Kentucky University. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just get used to being bad. Like almost every race is just bad. And so I think like like that helps a lot too. It's, um, you're sort of used to um, kind of performing and then also like people commenting on that performance. So yeah. Um, but for me, it's just like, I can see why people wouldn't want to read the comments. I would say my audience is pretty nice um, on the aggregate. Like there are some weird ones in there, but most of the time people are like, thank you. Like, thank you for doing this. And it's like, wow, you're welcome. Like, thanks for watching. And I feel like that is so much more rewarding if you can get through like the really, really toxic comments than just not reading them at all. Yeah. And a reason why we're doing a kind of lengthy tangent on this is 
I think what you've done with your specific niche is really interesting. And I hope we live in a world where people see the different tools that you're using, that I'm using to try doing what you're doing in different categories. Maybe it's healthcare, maybe it's, you know, FinTech, like there, there are always like different niches that you could really do what you're doing in. And the hardest thing about doing what you're doing, what I'm doing, at least on one platform is there's no help. Like I don't, I, you don't have, I assume you don't have like an executive producer. So I think people should read the comments. I think people should engage with their audience because it, what's usually happening is they don't have someone with an earpiece. I came, I come from television. So in television, there's someone in a control room saying, Hey, Kyla, you didn't say X, Y, and Z thing. Remember to point that out next time. How do you just think about doing this on your own? Because that it's in of itself seems to be, if we're talking about the broader creator economy, something that people and more are talking about, whether it's burnout, whether it's, man, this is just really damn hard. How are you thinking about that? Yeah. I mean, like I have a lot of creator friends, like we are financial creator space is pretty small. So we're all pretty tight. Um, there are dozens of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. But it, it can be incredibly lonely and like people will never kind of experience like your exact video or like your exact comment section, your exact feedback, um, you know, how you feel after posting a video that didn't do well, that you really worked hard on. Um, that sort of process can be really tough. And then also like the monetization aspect of it absolutely sucks. <laughs> um, like nobody is really building, nobody's building in the, I have that's a whole other thing, but like nobody's building in the right way for creators to monetize and just sort of relying on them to keep on leveraging themselves to do brand ads and stuff like that. And that's. So that's, um, so what's, so what's the, so what's the wrong way? So like, what, like, what's the status quo? What's not yeah. working? I mean, not working yeah. is the wrong way to put it, but like, what, what does that mean? I mean, a lot of the times it's just like, okay, you're going to run an ad for us. And it makes sense. Like it's perfect for brands. Like get us access to like all this distribution that the creators already have. Absolutely wonderful. But like the monetization is so, it's like the wild west out there. It's a freaking wild west. You have um, some brands that like go under, undercut creators. Some brands are super generous and are just like awesome to work with. I'm not speaking about like any brands that I personally work with. It's just like stories that I've heard. Um, but yeah, it's just tough out there. And, and I don't think there's a lot of um, support, especially like mental health wise. Like these comments can be really toxic and there's not a lot of support on the back end for that. You're just kind of like thrown into this. and. Um, it, there's not, I don't think there's a way in our heads to like contextualize what it really, really means to be like super online yet. Um, I just don't think anybody like, it's hard to like wrap your mind around, okay, uh, 500,000 people just saw my most recent video. What does that mean? You know, do you get recognized on the streets? The uh, streets? Got- that made it sound like way more. <laughs> do, 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 people, do people do people see you in public? Um, I I have been recognized twice now, which is like I never know how to what to say. I'm just like, oh, what's your favorite video of mine? Like it just sounds so terrible. Um, but yeah, it's it's cool. Um, and I'm asking it, it that. I'm yeah. asking that because I like your point you just made about we haven't wrapped our heads around what online is because that goes yeah. back to the metaverse conversation, which yeah. is that. Actually, when you're doing this and people are seeing that, that's actually forming an interaction. So I, I, I just think that's, I think that's really fascinating. I, this is something I just ask people when they're in that position where statistically speaking, people have seen you, but what does that mean? I think we understand what that means when it comes to television. I think if you yeah. were a movie star, there's, but even the, even, oh, here's a question for you. Um, when people see you in public, and I'm really not trying to do this for your ego, do they feel an intimate connection with you. So for context, I podcast and by podcasting, I do around three to four episodes a week. So there are some people who will spend around five hours of my voice in their head every single week. And that interaction actually makes people feel very comfortable. Like, Hey, like, what's up? It's Marshall. Hey, like, what's up? How's how's it going? Um, And that totally works. That totally makes sense for me. How does that relationship work with TikTok? Um, cause I'm just wondering how that intimacy platform bit works for you. Para, parasocial relationships are a really big problem. I think, um, like with the people who have met, like they're totally nice and they're just like super kind, whatever. Um, but there are people who, you know, live in your DMs and they're basically talking to themselves in there. Uh, and that can be a little bit weird because they think that they're talking to you, even though they're not. And so I think like 
And I like, and I'm sure you do the same when you're podcasting. And it's like, I put on a front in my videos. Like I'm personally an introvert. I'm not extroverted. Um, like I'm not like this outgoing boisterous person most of the time. And so I think when people like how they would picture me in their heads and like, if they did know, like the, I, like uh, who's the real Kyla, right? Like, is it the Kyla in the videos? Is it Kyla who's not in the videos? Um, to them, it's probably the Kyla in the videos, but that's not like actually in reality, right? Um, so it, it can just get a little bit weird to like think about what that means, yeah. Yeah, so the last question, this goes back to the conversation around just mental health and how you're approaching this. What's so tough about the space you're in is it probably just feels like you have to always be on, always be closing, always be creating. Like, what are your, what are your just your, what do you do? Like, what are your, I, I hope your hobby isn't TikTok because that doesn't seem like the right thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do spend quite a bit of time on content creation, but um, I, I'm a big fan of like working out. I always make time to go either to yoga or the gym, ride my bike. Um, I love cycling. I wrote a piece about it that um, I think resonated with a lot of people and personally was like one of my favorite pieces that I've ever written about my first time riding 50 miles where I didn't have any water, didn't have any food, basically like almost died (laughs) um, on San Vicente in in Santa Monica in California. Um, But yeah, I love cycling. I just love being outside. Um, Connecting to nature is like so important, especially because I spend like a lot of the week just in front of my computer, like hunched over. So the more that I can be outside and on my bike and feeling like the earth around me, the, the happier I am. Let's close with substance then since you brought up working out. Should we be excited about Peloton, gyms? There's this whole, I mean, Equinox just sent out a notice about um, vaccination cards um, and and, and masking. So there's this whole big debate around these spaces. How should we just think of uh, the stock market and just company valuations when it comes to the fitness industry? Yeah. I mean, I like if fitness is hard, it's hard to like crack. Uh, so Peloton has done a really good job. Um, you know, getting, I know that you're going to ride your bike later. Right. Uh, <laughs> so I think Peloton has done a really good job. Quick, at- quick context. Um, I, t- I, I, and Kyla, mm-hmm. um, shouted out her piece, but I really, her, I really recommend people read, um, the piece on biking 50 miles. And I told her before the episode that I was going to go ride my Peloton after, um, very inspirational. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, you know, you have fitness in your house. So I think that there's sort of like this movement towards health in America. And you can see that in sort of the bifurcation, you know, circling back to the grocery grocery store discussion, the bifurcation of grocery stores, like natural alternative grocers are rising in terms of popularity. People are really thinking about their health and they're like, dude, like the food that we're eating might be killing us. And I think fitness has a big role in that. And it's like, how do we move? How do we, you know, be happier. And a lot of that comes through fitness. So, um, getting, getting back to like more substance, uh, fitness valuations are tough. Um, I think Peloton has done a lot of work in this space, but like consumer fitness and consumer brands, they're just tough to have a lot of longevity, I think. We're waiting the big epic post. Well, Kyla, thank you so much for coming. This is really helpful. We cover a lot of different bases. So the show notes for this episode will be particularly intense with context and everything. So uh, yeah, anything you want to quickly shout out other than your uh, biking piece? No, yeah. Um, please subscribe to my Substack and my YouTube. If you're on TikTok, uh, please you know watch that. Uh, and uh, on, I'm on Twitter as well and LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, if you have any feedback, comments, questions, concerns, I'm pretty accessible. So just feel free to message me. Great. Thanks, Kyla.